So, like I said, today we're going to do the remainder of 3 2. And 3 2 is about quadratic functions. And we saw that if we have a quadratic function, let's call it f of x equals x squared minus 3x. Um, whoops, wrong one. Minus 28. All right. To find the x-intercepts, forces us to solve this quadratic equation. And if we have I'm just thinking what I want what number I want there. If I have something like that to find my x intercepts. We would need to solve that. Now, solving these two equations is solving a quadratic equation, right? So we're going to be solving quadratic equations for essentially the rest of three, two, right? Now, the thing about solving quadratic equations is there's actually a lot of different methods to solve quadratic equations. So... Solving quadratic equations. All right. So there's many methods for doing that. We're going to list out four in this class. We're going to go over four methods. The first method is with factoring. Factoring in the zero factor property. We'll talk about that when we get there. A second method is the square root method. A third method is completing the square. And a fourth method is the quadratic formula.
By the way, for this class, I want you to know both of these, numbers one and two, and then when you get down to three and four, it's about the same, so you can kind of just pick and choose which one you like, all right, between these two. So if you're gonna need factoring, we're gonna use that a lot. We'll use square root method sum, and then we will end up with quadratics that we can't factor, so we'll have to use those, one of those two, and just use the easier one, the one that you like better. Okay, for most people, that's gonna be the quadratic form. Okay. So let's talk about solving with factor. All right. When we solve with factoring, what we are going to do is, uh, let, me, let me take a step back. I'm saying solving with factoring, this is specific to quadratic equations, all right? So everything was specific to quadratic equations. So when we solve with factoring, what we want to do is we want to get one side equal to zero. And then factor the other side. And then use the zero factor property. Now, the zero factor property is a property that says if I have two numbers that multiply times each other and give me zero. The only way two numbers multiply to give you zero is if one of them is zero. So zero factoring, uh, zero factor property says if you have this, so if you have two numbers multiply to zero, then either A is zero or B is zero because a and B are going to be linear pieces, then we can solve each of these equations, whatever they happen to be, right? And so then solve each equation. So that's what we're doing with fact, okay? It turns out, that this quadratic equation is really nice to solve via factoring. This is what I had on the board earlier when we were trying to find those x-intercepts. So let's say we want to solve this one via factor. Now, one side is already zero. So that step one is done for me. One side is already equal to zero. So I need to factor the other side. And hopefully we remember how to factor at least a basic quadratic with one as the coefficient of the x squared part. 
we would look at this and we'd say, well, what are factors of negative 28 that add up to negative three? So like two and negative 14 are not gonna work. Three is not a factor of 28. Four and negative seven multiply to give you negative 28 and then add to give you a negative three. So I'm looking at four and negative seven. Those are the factors that I want. And I can, since this has a one as a coefficient of the x squared, I can say, well, that means that quadratic can be factored as x plus four times x minus seven. Now, if two factors multiply to give you zero, the zero factor, the zero factor property says that either x plus four, either this number has to be zero, or the x minus seven has to be zero. One of those two things has to be true. We'll subtract four from each side in this equation, and we'll add seven to each, uh, each side in the other equation. And that tells me that x is negative four, or x is a positive seven. And that's it. That means there are two solutions to this quadratic equation. One of the solutions is negative four. The other solution is seven. You can check that out if you want. You can plug in negative four and then plug in seven and see that both give you true statements. In Moodle, when you write your answer, it'll say write the smaller one first and the bigger one second, or the bigger one first and the smaller one second. So just make sure you write them in order. If it said write the larger one and you put negative four, it'll mark it as wrong. So just be careful about that. So that's the basics of factoring. If we have a quadratic equation that can be solved via factoring, we get one side equal to zero, factor the other side, set both pieces equal to zero, solve both pieces. All right, that's basically what this says. Let's do another. Let's say we have x squared plus 25 is equal to 10x. And we want to solve this via factor. Well, the first thing I would do is I would get one side equal to zero. I want to solve via factoring. I want to get one side equal to zero. Factoring is always a lot nicer if I have a one as a coefficient for my x squared term or my variable squared term, whatever variable this happens to be. It won't always be x, but it's gonna be a y or a z or whatever. Yeah. 
Because when I have a one in front of that x squared term, I can always take my last term, which is a positive 25. And say what factors add up to negative 10? Anybody know the two factors that add up to negative 10? Not a lot of factors of 25, right? 1 and 25, and then 5 and 5. So 1 and 25, 5 and 5, and then obviously you can do the negatives. Negative 1 times negative 25, negative 5 times negative 5. The ones that add up to negative 10 are the negative 5, negative 5 factors. So we get x minus 5 times another copy of x minus 5 set equal to 0. Now, if we apply the same principle we did over there, we set each factor equal to zero. Notice that since these factors are repeated, I actually get the same number twice. So technically, there's only one solution, but it's a repeated solution. All right. The fancy word for this is that five has multiplicity of two. It happens twice as a solution in the factor. But there you go. And I don't know, Moodle may ask you just what is the answer and have one blank. But if it has two blanks, you can just repeat five twice. Okay. Like I said, factoring is nicest. If I have a 1 in front of my x squared, you can also do factoring with other things in front of your x squared. You just have to kind of know some tricks. I'm not going to get into a lot of factoring. You can really do a deep dive into factoring. What I want you to be able to do is this kind of stuff. And then some other techniques that we'll see. Um, in a moment. So let's try to do this. Let's solve via factory. I'll use a different variable this time. Let's say I have z squared equals 4z plus 12. I want you to go ahead and try to solve that with factor.
All right. Once you get uh, efficient at this, it goes pretty quick. Again, especially if I have a one in front of my variable square term. So if I have a one in front of, as the coefficient of my square term. Putting all of the, terms on the same side and getting zero on the other yields z squared minus 4z minus 12 equals zero. So we're looking at factors of negative 12 because there's a one in front of my square term. And the factors that multiply to give you negative 12 and add to give you negative four are two and negative six. Is that right? Again, I just go through what times what gives me 12. I can list them all off if we want, but by the way, it doesn't matter which one you write first. If you like to write the negative six first, or the positive two first. Doesn't really matter. Z minus six times Z plus two equals zero. The zero factor properly says, I can set each factor to be equal to zero. Add six to both sides on the first equation, subtract two from both sides on the second equation. In the first equation, we get an answer of z equals six. In the second equation, I get an answer that is z equals negative two. All right. So those are my two answers. Again, if they say write the bigger one first, six goes first. If they say write the smaller one first, negative two goes first. Whatever. Order of Moodle says it to be. Now, I like factoring and using factoring a lot with the coefficient of my squared term is a positive one. If it's a negative one, I'll just move it to the other side, obviously. But when I have coefficients on my squared terms that are more than one or different than one, then I like to, usually I turn to one of those other methods. Okay. And it'll just be almost as quick. Again, sometimes you'll see factoring easy when you have like a two out there or something else. But uh, usually when we say solve me of factoring, I like to have one as a coefficient. Now there is an exception on that. And the exception is this. Let's say I have two y squared plus 22 y is equal to zero. If I want to solve this one via factoring, notice there's no constant term, right? One side's already zero, just like it was over here, but there's no constant term. So in this case, if there's no constant term, instead of trying to factor this way, 
All I'm going to do is I'm going to factor by pulling out a greatest common factor. So if I can pull out a greatest common factor, in this case, that's 2y. Both coefficients are divisible by 2. And then y and y squared, both divisible by y. Now, a lot of times I write this as 2y times y plus 11 equals 0. But realize this is the same thing as what we have here. We have two numbers that are multiplied to give you 0. Doesn't matter that one of them was just the greatest common factor. So we can either set 2y equal to 0 or y plus 11 equal to 0. In this first equation, you divide both sides by 2 and get y equals 0. In the second equation, you subtract 11 from both sides and get y equals negative 11. So don't forget that one way of factoring is to pull out a greatest common factor. Sometimes that ha helps me. And in this case, that's the way we solve this. Again, you, we could do a whole day on just factoring all these different scenarios. But for this class, most of what we'll deal with in factoring is factoring the one as a coefficient of your x squared term or y squared term or whatever the squared term is. And then pulling out greatest common factors. Those are probably the biggest two for us. Any questions about that? All right. So now let's move on to the next method. The next method is the square root method. So the square root method means that we want to get something squared. is equal to a number. So I want to get something squared is equal to a number. If I have this, then what I do is I set A as either the positive square root of whatever the number is, or it could have been the negative of the square root of whatever the number is, because when I square a negative, I get a positive, right? So it could have been either the positive version of that square root or the negative version of the square root. And for sake of ease, I'll just write plus or minus in front of it. That's how we usually write that. And then lastly, so then I'm gonna solve. If A is just a variable, then there's, it's basically solved already. But if A has something more involved, so then I'll solve A as the positive square root of the number. And solve the other one. A is being the negative square root of that number.
Now, this square root method really comes in handy when I already have something squared where my variable is inside of here. All right. If I don't already have that set up where my variable is inside of an expression being squared, then I probably will use one of the other methods. So let's go ahead and solve using the square root method. And a really nice equation to solve using the square root method is the one I had on the board earlier. Zero equals x minus three squared minus eight. Notice how my variable is in inside of an expression being squared. And everything outside of that is a constant number. That's when I'm looking for the square root method to be used. Now, in order to use the square root method, I need to get something squared equals a number. So I need to isolate this something squared. In my case, x minus 3 is being squared. So to isolate that, I'm going to add a to both sides. So I have eight is equal to x minus three squared. Now, some people like their variable on the left-hand side. Some people are okay with using a variable on the right or left, it doesn't matter. I'm going to put this, I'm going to put it on the left hand side. A lot of times people like seeing the variable on the left, so I'll leave it that way. And what we're going to do now, if something squared is equal to a number, I'm going to say that something could either be the positive or the negative of the square root of eight. Now, the square root of 8 is not a rational number. It's an irrational number. You could simplify it as 2 root 2 if you wanted to. You guys know how to do that. So 8 has a factor of 4. So you could rewrite that. Square root of 4 times two, square root of four becomes two, times, this is still under the square root. So, you could do something like that if you wanted to. So you can rewrite square root of eight as two root two, if you like. But this gives me two equations, one of which is x minus three, is equal to positive two root two. The other is that x minus three is equal to the negative of two root two. In both cases, I'm gonna add three to both sides. And that will give me my two answers. My first answer is three plus two root two. That's gonna be some ugly decimal, right? If I typed it in my calculator. And the other answer is three minus two root two. And again, that's 
I'm not exactly sure what Moodle would ask for an answer there. It may ask you for an exact answer where you have to use square roots, but more likely than not, it's probably going to ask you for a decimal version of this. So you just type in three plus two root two in your calculator. Or if it asks you for the decimal version, you really didn't need to change it to from square root of eight to two root two. Does that make sense? So you could have just said three plus square root of eight. That's one answer. And three minus square root of eight is your other answer. Is that all right? By the way, I want you to know that because we got these irrational numbers, this means something about this equation. If I were to multiply this out and try to factor, it would not have worked, okay? Because these are irrational numbers. So the factoring over the whole numbers or over the integers is not going to work. Okay. So if you try that via factoring and multiplying things out, wouldn't work. Let's try to solve this one using the square root property. Or using the square root method, I should say. Let's take three times x minus seven squared minus eight is equal to. Sixty-seven. I want you to try to isolate that squared term with the variable in it, and then use the square root method on this one. All right, so let's solve this. We add eight to both sides to begin with.
think that's 75, right? So then we divide both sides by three. Those first two steps are just an attempt to get my x minus seven squared all by itself on the left-hand side. Once you have this set up, then we can apply that square root property and say, well, x minus seven, therefore, is either equal to the positive version or the negative version of the square root of 25. Now, unlike this previous problem, the square root of 25 is a whole number. It's five, right? So we either get x minus seven is equal to a positive five, or x minus seven is equal to a negative five. It's gonna square root of 25 is five. Sometimes it'll work out like this, where I get nice integers, where the thing that's on my, inside my square root is a whole number, or well, is a perfect square, you phrase that, it's a perfect square. Other times, it won't, and the thing inside my square root, yeah, it's a whole number, but the square root of it is an irrational number. All right, add seven to everything, and you'll see that the two answers are that x is equal to 12, or x is equal to two. By the way, that means that if I would have like expanded this whole thing out and then went to factor, I would have ended up with factors that worked out. That makes sense. Now, doing the expansion is probably harder than using the square root method, but it could have been done via factor. You guys know what I mean by that? I want to go through that really quickly because it highlights a feature. of factoring that I haven't gone through yet. So, if I want to do this via factoring, what would I have had to do? Well, I've had to square this. That would have been x squared minus 14x plus 49 inside that parentheses. Is okay with that. And then I have to multiply three in. And then I would have had to get got zero on one side. And I would have essentially done a lot of work. Now, 147 minus eight minus 67. Let me think about that. 147 minus eight minus 67, that's 72. So I have done a lot of algebraic work to get it into something that I can easily factor. That's my point. Okay. And if you notice something about this, 
The x squared term does not have a one as a coefficient, it has a three. The first thing I would look for is to say, can I pull out a greatest common factor of three? Yeah, 72 is divisible by three, 42 is divisible by three, three x squared divisible by three, right? So yes, I can pull out a greatest common factor, so I'm gonna start by doing that. And then I can factor this inside piece. I can say what factors of 24 add up to negative 14. Anybody know those factors? 24 factors of 24. So one, two, yeah. Two times 12, three times eight, four times six and then the negatives of those, right? Since the middle term is negative, I'm just gonna put the negatives up there. And then the negative two and negative 12 are the things that work. So we got the three, and then this other piece factors into x minus two times x minus 12 equals zero. Now, technically, we have three things that are multiplied to give you zero. And so either the first thing could be zero. Obviously, three is not zero. So that's not going to work. Or the second piece could have been zero. Or the third piece could have been zero. You guys are saying what I'm doing there. I'm saying we have three numbers that multiply to give you zero, so one of them has to be zero. Three can't be zero, so that's never going to give me a solution. But these other two give me two solutions. So either x is equal to two or x is equal to 12. So yes, this one could have been solved using either the square root property or the factoring method. In this case, I would say probably using the square root method is easier, right? Just because I don't have to do all this algebra, messy algebra up front. Now, I wanted to go over this for two reasons. One, to show you, yes, you can still do the messy algebra and get it down to something like this, right? And then use one of the other methods, but that the square root method is easier in this case, all right? So if you have something with uh, something squared, isolate that. The other thing I wanted to use this one in particular is that, um, Remember I said, usually I like using ones in front of my x squareds or my variable squared piece. But if you don't, maybe you try to factor it out. Maybe you try to factor out that greatest common factor. And then maybe the other piece you can factor. Now let's do one other solve using the square root method. This one will be a little bit more straightforward. Let's take um, x plus 4 squared plus 18 is equal to 8. 
I want you to go ahead and solve that one using the square root method. All right, let's go through this. In this case, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to subtract 18 from both sides so that we isolate that x plus 4 squared. And then we're going to take the square root of both sides. Namely, I'm going to say x plus 4 is either the positive version or the negative version of the square root of negative 10. Now, from what we did last class period, we know that when you have a square root of a negative, that's an imaginary number, right? So what we really have here it is x plus 4, let me write it this way, x plus 4 is the positive i root 10. Square root of 10 does not simplify, so that's an irrational number. Or, x plus 4 is equal to the negative version of i root 10. So the i comes from here, and then you have to do the positive or, ver or negative version of i root 10. Does that make sense? Now, when you subtract 4 from both sides, you are getting negative four plus i times root 10. Some people would write the root 10 first. Doesn't really matter. You could write root 10 times i or i root 10. I usually like to write i root 10 because uh, then I know the i is not underneath the square root. It's easier to see. A lot of times if people do root 10 times i, then you don't know. People write it like root 10 i, and then you don't know if i is underneath or um, or behind the square root. So I move my i up front, that's all, with square roots. If I had any other number, I'd probably use the number up front. But these are just complex numbers, right? Complex numbers. And again, if you'd rather write 4 plus the square root of 10 times i, 
that's fine too. I don't know what the square root of 10 is. It's three point something or other, but it's an irrational number. We just get complex numbers for our two answers. And that's okay, right? We can solve quadratic equations. It's okay that we got complex numbers as our answers. Sometimes that happens. Obviously, because we got complex numbers and we got complex numbers with irrationals, if you multiply this out and try to factor, it's not going to factor. Okay. Not going to factor it. Any questions about that? Solving using the square root property. So sometimes we get irrational numbers there. Sometimes we get complex numbers. Sometimes we get nice integers. All right, we've seen all three cases. So let's then move on to the next method. So we're going to use the method of completing the square. I'll probably only do this maybe once, maybe twice, OK? Because I tend to do the quadratic formula when I encounter something that I can either use completing the square or quadratic formula. I tend to use quadratic formula. But I'll show you completing the square as well. <clears throat> so the first step is to get x squared plus bx equals some other number. I'll just call it an n for number. It doesn't have to be a whole number. X squared plus bx equals n. I need to get it to look like that. I need that form. And what I do is I add something to both sides. Here's what I add. I add b over 2 squared to both sides. If I add b over 2 squared, to both sides, I get that. All right. But here's the thing about this special number, b over 2 squared, is that now this left-hand side is actually a perfect square. And that left-hand side can now convert to x plus b over 2 quantity squared is equal to some other number. 
Again, this is just going to be some other number, whatever this b over 2 squared plus the number is. And now I can solve using the square root method. I follow that. Four solved using square root method. So in other words, completing the square forces my equation to be in the square root method, and then I just solve using that square root method. Now I'm gonna give myself a little more room, but I'll do an example. So solve using completing the square. Let's say I have x squared plus 8x minus 10 is equal to 0. Now, if you try to factor this, there are no factors of negative 10 that add up to 8. So you can check that. There's no whole number. I mean, that's probably what I'd try first, right? If it was already in this form, I'd probably try factoring if I could. So I try factoring, doesn't work. So this says, let's use completing the square. That means I need to get the x squared and the x term on the same side. And also I need to get a one in front of this x squared term. To get the x and the x squared term on the same side and a number on the other side, I'm just going to add 10 to both sides. Now, what I usually do is I usually leave a space because I know I'm going to add this special term b over 2 squared. Okay, I know I'm going to add that special term to both sides. You know what most people do, though, before they add the term? Most people, since I know I'm trying to get something squared equals a number, most people kind of write this step as well. All right, this next step. Two. Oh, I, my, my apologies. I forgot to mention, this already has a one, so I don't need to divide by the coefficient here, right? It's already got a one. I'm all set. If it did have some other coefficient, I'd have to divide by whatever that coefficient is. So I need to add b over 2 squared. And what most people do is most people do the b over 2. Well, in this case, half of 8 is 4, right? And then I square that. So half of eight is four, I square that, and therefore the thing I need to add on both sides is a positive 16. We're okay with that. 
Now, the whole method is called completing the square because what I just did here is I created a polynomial that is a perfect square, namely this polynomial is x plus four squared. It has to be, every time I do that, if I take half, put it in here, then square it, this thing is going to be x plus four squared. Everybody get that? I mean, it, it's gotta be, because when you multiply out, let's just take x plus, uh, I'm gonna use a different letter, x plus any number squared, and you multiply that out, you get x squared plus ax plus another ax, so that gives you two axes, and then plus the a squared. So when you say, well, how did I know I needed to do b over two? In here, I know whatever's in here is gonna be half of the coefficient of the x. I see that. And then I know this thing squared is gonna be whatever this number is squared. So that's why we kind of get what we get. And that's why it's called completing the square. I added a number to both sides that makes my left-hand side a perfect square. Now, I have this equation. And this equation is solvable using the square root method that we just did. So I can simply say, Therefore, x plus 4 is the positive or negative square root of 26. I'm going to do this in one step. Hopefully, this doesn't throw you off. Square root of 26 doesn't simplify. So we're going to solve both equations the same way. We're going to get x equals negative 4 plus the square root of 26 as one answer. The other answer is going to be negative 4 minus the square root of 26. All right. The positive version gives you plus the square root of 26. Negative version gives you minus the square root of 26. Now, completing the square property can get messy and ugly if we have messy and ugly numbers, all right? So if it has messy, num ugly numbers, then, you know, dividing by two and squaring things, those become messy and ugly as well, all right? But that's the idea. Set, get this set up. Add b over 2 squared to both sides, you get this, and that gave you a perfect square on the left-hand side. And then you can use the square root method to solve it. And this is a special thing that makes this b over 2 squared, that's a special thing that makes this, forces that to be a perfect square. And in particular, this perfect square. Let me do one more, completing the square. This will be the last. Let's say I have two x squared. Minus 20 x plus 18 set equal to zero. We always want to get this setup where we have our x squared, our x on one side, 
and a constant on the other if we're doing completely square. So I'm going to subtract 18 from both sides. That's going to give me 2x squared minus 20x is equal to a negative 18. Now at this stage, I have a 2 is my coefficient for the x squared. So I'm divide everything by 2, divide both sides by 2. By the way, if you wanted to divide both sides by 2 at the very beginning and then move your constant over, you could have done that as well, right? doesn't matter which order you do that in. So I get x squared minus 10x equals negative 9. Now, completing the square, again, I tend to write, start writing this uh, line first. I'm going to go half of this number. By the way, be careful, this is a negative 10. So half of that number is a negative 5. So this is going to be x minus 5 squared. And then I'm going to square that number. Negative 5 times negative 5. Negative times negative is a positive 25. So I'm going to add 25 to both sides. And 25 is just, again, half of this number squared. So we're adding 25 to both sides. I end up with x minus 5 squared is equal to 16. And now I take and apply that square root method. So I get x minus 5 is either the positive version or the negative version of the square root of 16. Now, the nice thing about 16 is that it's a perfect square. So square root of 16 is just 4. So I either get x minus 5 is equal to a positive 4 or x minus 5 is equal to a negative 4. Adding 5 to both sides yields two answers. Either x is 9 or x is 1. What did this mean about this original equation? Could have factored, right? So we did a lot of work here. We're probably factoring would have been quicker, I would imagine, by pulling out the, you know, factoring on the greatest common factor of two and factoring what's inside. In my last example, I would not have been able to factor that. Just so you know, with completing the square, just like the square root method of solving, you can get answers that are integer numbers. You can get answers that are irrational numbers. You can also get complex numbers. And in Moodle, if it asks you for your two answers 
and you know your two answers are nine and one. But they say, well, write your two answers as complex numbers. Nine is simply nine plus zero i, right? And one is just one plus zero i. So if it says write your answers, they could be complex. So they might be in this form. And they turn out to be just integers. Just use zero as your coefficient in front of your i. All right. All right. Now the last method is the quadratic formula method. The quadratic formula wants you to get the following form. Get your equation to look like ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero. So quadratic formula wants one side equal to zero, just like factoring basically. So general form, right? From last time. And by the way, the square root method kind of went in the standard form, right? This one's the general form equal to zero. Square root of the one standard form in some sense. So we have this. And the quadratic formula says the solutions are given by the following big formula. We take opposite of B plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, that b squared minus 4ac are all under the square root, divided, the entire thing divided by 2a. So opposite of b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, where the a, b, and c are just the coefficients in this original form, right? So the solutions are given by that, and then we simplify whatever that is. To solve. So let's solve something using the quadratic form. Let's take x squared plus 5x plus 17 is equal to 0. By the way, in general, if you solve something like this, the first thing you probably try is to try to factor, right? This one does not factor, though. There's no factors of 17 
that I had to find. Okay. So, yeah, don't forget about factoring. Don't, factoring is usually the most straightforward one, but a lot of equations are not going to factor. Like this one does not factor. So what we have to do is say, well, in this case, we already have that form, the ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. B here is five. So when we say opposite of B, we say the negative of five. Plus or minus square root of B squared minus four times A times C. That's gonna be minus four times one times 17. all divided by two times A. Now, when I solve and simplify, so this is the, these are the two solutions. One of them is a solution with a plus sign in here. The other is a solution with a minus sign in here. Okay. Usually I start simplifying before I separate the two solutions. Now the first thing I usually do is just solve what's underneath the square root. So five squared minus four times one times 17 gives me a negative 43. Is that right? We have a negative 43. So I ended up with negative 43 underneath the square root. Well, negative underneath the square root means we're going to have I. So we get negative 5 plus or minus I times the square root of 43 over 2. This means my two answers are the following. One of them is going to be using the plus sign. So negative 5 plus i root 43 over 2, which if I wrote as a complex number would be negative 5 halves plus square root of 43 over two times i, right? So that would be this written as a complex number. So to divide the real part and divide the imaginary part both by two. And then the other solution would be negative five minus i root 43 over two which rewritten as a complex number is negative five halves minus root 43 over two times i. So the difference in those two numbers, one is a plus and one is a minus. And I believe when Moodle asks you for your answers, and if it's a complex number, it's just going to ask in this way, this number, you probably just round a couple decimal places, this number, you probably just round a couple decimal places. All right. I'll leave, I'll leave it like that for right now. That's more precise. But. So that's the quadratic formula. And so if you're good at algebraic simplification, 
the quadratic formula is pretty nice. It's this formula that gives us our answers. We could have used completing the square on this one. If we wanted to. But it turns out it's just quadratic formula in this case is probably less work. Because if you think about if you had to complete the square, you had to divide five by two and then square it, right? So you'd get a 25 over four that you're adding to both sides. And adding an ugly fraction to both sides, not that fun. Does that make sense? So then B over two squared would be 25 over four. That's not very fun to deal with. Any questions about quadratic formula? Now, quadratic formula allows us to do lots and lots of solving. So let me ask you to solve this one. Let's solve three z squared minus two z minus um sorry. Uh, let's just do minus 10 equals zero. Good. I'll just try this one on your own using the quadratic formula.
All right, so let me go through this. Now, on this one, I already have it in the form I want it to be. One side is equal to zero. The other side has a squared term, a linear term, a constant term. So when we say opposite of B, we're talking about the opposite of the negative two. Be careful about that. A lot of people will put negative two there. That's the opposite of negative two. So that's going to become a positive two when I simplify. Plus or minus the square root of B squared. Put the negative two into parentheses when you square it. Minus four times A times C. Four times three times negative 10 in this case. All over two times three. That's two times A or two times three. Now I'm gonna start simplifying. On the top, I get a positive two plus or minus the square root And then I simplify whatever's underneath that square root. Negative two squared is gonna be a positive four, minus four times three times negative 10 is 124. Now, this gives me two answers. One of the answers is 2 plus square root of 124 all over 6. The other is 2 minus square root of 124 all over 6. Now, both of those are going to be irrational numbers. But you could simplify those if you wanted to. If you wanted to go through the process of um, factoring 124 and then pulling out, simple, you know, doing that kind of stuff, you could. I'm not going to right now because that's not the important part of this section. So you could simplify that. But both of those are just real numbers, right? They're irrational, but real. Which tells you that this original thing was not going to be factored, right, over the integers. Any questions about this? Pretty straightforward. <clears throat> now, by the way, this highlights why I tend to go to quadratic formula over completing the square, this example. And I'm not going to go through the entire process of completing the square, but I will talk through this. You don't have to write this down. Please, in fact, don't. If I were to have completed the square on this, I would have had to add 10 to both sides. And then what would I have had done next? I'd have to divide by three. And then I'm dealing with ugly fractions, right? And then I would have had to cut that in half. And then square it. I would have had to add 4 over 36 to both sides, or you could have said add 1 ninth to both sides. That simplifies as 1 ninth.
And then all of a sudden I'm dealing with lots of ugly fractions and I don't want to do that. Okay. So the quadratic formula, yeah, it has a denominator at the very end, but I'm not really dealing with those ugly fractions until I hit that spot at the very end. I'm dividing by six. That makes sense. If I was going to use messy fractions, I might as well use as messy fractions as I wanted, as I could possibly find, right? Um, so just use variables in there. Which kind of also highlights the connection between completing the square and the quadratic formula. This is nothing that I'm going to ask you on a test or anything, but there is a really nice connection between completing the square and the quadratic formula. Let's say I want to solve by completing the square. And I want to solve this equation that's written like I should use the quadratic formula. Um, well, I would subtract C from both sides. And then I would take both sides and I would make this coefficient in front of the x squared a one. That means I have to divide everything I see by an a. That'll make that coefficient be a one. I'll write this step here. What do I need to do? I need to take whatever that coefficient in front of the x is, and I need to take and cut that in half. Now, if you take b over a and cut it in half, that just means divide by 2. So. Cutting it in half is doing a b over 2a. That's another way of saying cut it in half, but divide by 2. And then I square that number. And then add it to both sides. So the number I'm going to add to both sides is b over 2a squared. Now I'm going to try before I apply the square root property or I apply the square root method I'm going to simplify this a little bit right in order to simplify this First, I'm going to rewrite it.
with the B squared in front. Because in order to simplify, I need to get common denominators. So that means I need to multiply this fraction. Oh, shoot. For x squared. Thank you for that. By 4a on top and on bottom. That'll give me common denominators. Are you okay with that? So you get x plus b over 2a squared equals b squared over 4a squared minus 4a times c over 4a squared. One more step after we get common denominators before I get this up with square roots is to, since I have common denominators, combine the numerators. Now let's apply the square root property or the square root method. Now, here's the thing about square roots. If I have a fraction that's being square rooted, I can take the square root of the top and then divide by the square root of the bottom. The square root of the bottom, in this case, square root of 4 is 2, square root of a squared is a. So that is simply 2a. To solve this, I would subtract b over 2a from both sides. And that would leave me with negative b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. Notice we have common denominators here of 2a. So I get x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. So by completing the square using arbitrary a, b, and c's, what I get is the quadratic formula. All right. That's how people figured out what the quadratic formula was. They said, well, how could I figure out what the solutions are? Well, let's take an arbitrary A, B, and C, and then just complete the square. They did that, and the quadratic formula popped up. And so now that we have the quadratic formula, We don't necessarily have to do completing the square. We can kind of choose which one we like. And most of the time, most people, when they have a choice between these two, utilize the quadratic formula because it's a little bit simpler and more straightforward. Now, I want to say something about just solving quadratic equations in general. Most of the time, the square root method is kind of obvious. If you have x minus 3 squared, and then there's no other variables anywhere, 
you're using the square root method. That's probably the easiest one to do. Or x minus 8, x plus 8, whatever the thing is, squared. So that one kind of pops out. Then what I tend to do is I tend to write my equation this way and see if factoring will work. And if factoring works, I use factoring. So if it's in the nice square root method form, I'll use square root method. If it's not, I'll see if it factors. I'll write it this way and see if it factors. And if it doesn't factor, then I'll use one of these two. And I tend to use quadratic formula more than I use completing the square. Okay. But you can use either. Is that all right? And all of that came out of trying to find x-intercepts on these quadratic functions. I know that's a lot. This was a long uh, section. 3-2 is a long section. But it does set us up for the stuff we're going to be doing in the later part of chapter three. Okay. So we really need to have those tools and function efficient, efficiently with those tools for the later parts of chapter three. Everybody comfortable solving quadratic equations, one of those four methods? And uh, then all the other stuff we did in 3 2 last time. Good. All right. So let's move on then to section 3 3. We're going to deal with power functions and polynomials. Now, a power function is a function that can be written as f of x is equal to some constant, we'll call that k, times x to a power, we'll call it p. Where k is a constant and p is any real number. All right, so that P could be a fraction, like one half. It could be negative 8.6. It could be a positive 12, All right? It could be any real number. So a power function is that. Notice a power function can only have one term. Right, we don't add lots of other terms. Now, here's the thing about these power functions. If my power happens to be a whole number,
if it's even, then the graph is going to look, so it's a, if P is a whole even number, and K is positive, then the graph has the general shape of a parabola pointed up. I say parabola in very loose terms. This could be increasing much faster than a parabola, than our standard x squared is. By the way, what's going to happen if k is negative? It's going to flip over, right? So if k is negative, And the graph is going to be pointed down, kind of just off to the side. So the graph has that shape. Now, if P is a whole number, which is odd, like x is x to the first, x to the third, x to the fifth. And k positive. Then the graph has this general shape. It's going to come from left down. And as it moves to the right, it's going to go up and to the right. So it's going to have that general shape if k is positive. If k is negative, then that shape just flips over. All right. Maybe I should do it that way. So a power function looks like that with any number, but if our powers are whole numbers, then we know the general shape of the graph. Let me go to Dennis numbers real quick. So I have a function that is, let's just say, 1 times x to the fourth. Okay? Again, notice the, the shape. It's not a parabola. It actually is increasing faster than a parabola. But it has that basic cup shape, right? And that's going to happen no matter what power I have. Obviously, the increase and the decrease is faster or smaller, depending on the power, but I have that cup shape, right? And obviously, if k is one half, then that tells me something about how fast or how spread out things are. So this is one half x squared, one half x to the fourth all that cup shape. If my power is odd, like one, then it's coming from the lower left, going towards upper right. If I go x to the third, coming from lower left, again, there's some more curving action when we have x to the third than we have x to the first, obviously but it's coming from the lower left going upper right. If we had x to the fifth, again, coming from lower left 
going to the upper right. And we know about translations of functions. So if any time we put a negative, it just flips over the axis. All right. So even powers have the cup shape. Odd powers have the shape where it goes from lower left to upper right. Okay, that's all. <clears throat> By the way, if they're not whole numbers, if the powers are not whole numbers, if it was like 2.1 as your power, then all bets are off in that case, right? Of what? We're not talking about shapes of those. You could, maybe I should. Let me just grab a couple. Just so that we're aware. If our power was 2.2, .2, oh, that did that, okay? What if it was 0 0.2? Of doing that strange shape. Okay. How about if it were negative, negative 1.2? Well, then we get some strange shape with an asymptote. Okay. So the things I said about whole even numbers, whole odd numbers, that goes out the window if we're talking about. Um, Negatives. We're not talking about negatives. Whole number has to be zero and above, right? Remember that? Zero, one, two, three, four. That's what we mean by whole numbers. So like negative 12 as your power, you get some really weird shaped stuff. Okay. Negative one is a power. You get some asymptotes in there. Negative 1.4. Again, asymptotes in there. So <clears throat> it's not as clear cut when you have other powers. But if you have whole numbers that just not negative, then we get those shapes. Okay. So P is a Whole even, whole odd numbers. If I know the shapes of these power functions, then what I can do is talk about the behavior of the power functions. So we're going to talk about the behavior of functions. And when we do so, there's some notation that we're going to introduce. The notation is just an arrow notation. For the sake of our class, most of this arrow notation will be involved with going towards infinity or negative infinity, all right? But you could technically do any. So as x goes to infinity, that's essentially saying, as your x variable gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? That 
That's the arrow notation. Graphically, what we're doing is we're moving to the right on the graph. Graphically, this means moving to the right. And in some sense, forever to the right, right? You just keep going on and on and on and on. <clears throat> so what we're going to ask is this. Let's, oh, and we can also do negative infinity. That means moving to the left graphically, all right? So what we're going to do is say, as x goes off to infinity, what does the function value do? Which means, what is the y going towards? So let's take the power function f of x is equal to 2 times x to the fourth. and ask about the behavior. As x goes to infinity, what does f of x do? And as x goes to negative infinity, what does my function f of x do? To know this, or to answer this question, I only need to know what the graph of this looks like. And like we just said, we have a positive k and an even whole number. So I know this is gonna be a cup shape of some sort. So as you move further and further and further to the right on this graph, what is the y value of the graph doing? As you move to the right, the y value is going off to positive infinity as well. Everybody see that? And the same thing to the left. As you move to the left, the y value is shooting off to positive infinity as well. That's all we're saying. As the x value goes to the right, the y value is shooting up. As the x value moves to the left, the y value shoots up. That's the arrow notation for these infinities. Some people say this is the behavior of the graph, others, Talk about the end behavior. It's the end, end meaning as they go to positive or negative infinity. Let me give you another end behavior. Let's take, I'll call it g of x equals negative three times x to the fifth power. 
and ask the same question. As x goes to infinity, what does the function value or the output value or the y value go to? And then say, as x goes to negative infinity, what does the output value or the y value or the function value go to? I want you to try to think through that on your own. Okay, so all we need to know is that this is an x to an odd power, positive odd power. If the k were positive, we have that shape, but the constant in front is negative, so we have to flip that shape. And it's looking, I drew it very poorly, but the idea. is there. So as we move towards the right, as x goes to infinity, as you move towards the right, the function is going to go down. So as x goes to infinity, the function goes to negative infinity. And as x goes to negative infinity, the function is moving to the as the x value moves to the left, function's going up. Outputs are going up. So that goes to positive infinity. So the end behavior of the graph is what we're looking at. End behavior of these power functions. So we've seen some power functions and their end behavior. And now we're going to transition to polynomial functions. Polynomial functions are functions that can be written like this. A n x to the n power plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 power plus, and you just keep going to get all the powers, a 1 x to the first power plus a constant, which we call a sub 0. Again, this is a function that can be written that way. Right. Where? First off, we don't want this term to be zero. So we force my a sub n to be non-zero. Right. All of the a's are real numbers. The n is a whole number. And that means what else? All these other powers are whole number powers. Okay. 
or says all powers of X to be whole numbers. So all of the powers on X are whole numbers. That's a polynomial function. Just for reference, I guess I can write it here. The A N X to the N. That's our highest power, okay? Everything else is less. That's why I did n minus one and then go down from there. So the highest exponent on your x, that term is the leading term We say the degree of the polynomial is n, and a sub n is the leading coefficient. So n is the degree, a sub n is the leading coefficient. So let's do an examination. Examine a couple of functions. f of x equals 5x to the third plus 8x squared minus 3x plus 10. First off, is that a polynomial? Yep, that's a polynomial. Look at all the x's. What are the exponents? Three, two, one. I guess you could say zero there, no x's, but three, two, one, those are all whole numbers. We're good to go, all right? So this is a polynomial. Is this a power function? No, remember, power functions only have one term, right? Power functions only have one term, so this is not a power function. The leading term is the 5x to the third, The lead coefficient or the leading coefficient is five, and the degree of the polynomial is three. Does that work? By the way, this shows us that some power functions are polynomials. Some polynomials could be power functions, but not all power functions are polynomials. So for instance, if you have g of x equals 5x to the 1.8, that's a power function, but not a polynomial. Right. 
we could have functions that are both. 8x squared is both a power function and a polynomial. Right, so that's both power function and a polynomial function. This is a power function, not a polynomial. This is a polynomial, but not a power function. And then obviously there's things that are neither. So if I go something like this, ax to the negative one minus five, x squared plus x to the one half. That's not a polynomial because we have, in fact, a couple of places where we have non-whole number exponents. But it's also not a power function because it's not just a single term. Right? Not power function. Not a polynomial function. So I'm saying, yes, they overlap in some places. They don't overlap in others. All right. We're out of time, but next time what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the end behavior of polynomial functions and then intercepts and things like that, okay? All right, so that's it for today. Uh, we're about halfway through 3.3. Three. Three, three is a little bit shorter. 3.2 is the longest section in this chapter. And uh, so, yeah, we're about halfway down to 3 3. That first homework is due Friday at 5. Don't forget that. Other than that, I'll see you on well, next week now, right? All right. See you next week.